Today we'll be watercolor pouring these beautiful purple flowers. They're called innocence flowers, tangled up in some weeds. And we'll be using Daniel Smith watercolors on arches paper, Windsor and Newton colorless masking fluid, as well as Princeton and King Art brushes. Using the end of my brush, I'll apply masking fluid to the lightest parts of each of the flowers. My masking fluid is now applied and I'll allow it to dry for about an hour. Now I'll be mixing up my first pour colors, which will be the purples of the flower. This first mix is quinacridone magenta and French ultramarine, and the second is cobalt teal with quinacridone rose. I swatch out the colors and look at, I'm already getting some color separation from the granulation, so cool. I'll begin by wetting just the areas where the flowers are using a two inch hockey brush. I allow the water to absorb on the paper to where it's just glistening and then begin to pour my purple mixes into the areas where I see flowers. Both of these mixes have granulating colors. So there should be some color separations where you see the blue and teal pull away from the magenta and rose color. This is an exciting way to make texture. <laughs> now to finger paint. <laughs> you need to make sure that when you're using masking fluid, you spread the paint in and around the masked area because sometimes it creates dams and you'll find that some areas don't get painted. I can already see some areas where the colors are pulling and separating. Using a fine mist sprayer, I'm going to accelerate that process by just misting the water over the dry parts of the paper to just help the purple colors spread out into the background a little bit. And this is the magic color separation that happens when you mix granulating colors with quinacridones. Beautiful blends, love it. Now I'll gently lean my board and let some of the paint run off the paper and into my tray. I try not to move the paint around too much because I don't want to lose all those lovely color separations, but I also don't want puddles of paint sitting on the paper, so I blot up any excess with a little bit of tissue. And while the paper is still wet, I'll add any splotches or splatters of additional color where I think it's needed. Since I didn't leave any puddles on the paper, these little splotches should stay somewhat in the area that they're dropped. So just a few more drops of concentrated color where the flowers are. And then I'm going to let this completely dry 100%. Remember, let it be and let it dry. <laughs> My first pour has completely dried. And now you can see, um, you know, your color shift, dry shift, how it lightens as it dries. You can see the beautiful color separation from using the granulating colors. And you can see how those purple areas are perfect right now to begin masking the next layer. When you use masking fluid, you always want to be very mindful of the shapes and silhouettes of the areas that are being masked. Masking fluid is tricky to work with and with practice, you will begin to be able to design your masking, being that you won't copy exactly like the photo reference, but you may make some design decisions where you choose to shape or do a silhouette that's a little more simplified than, say, the reference photo is. This is all trial and error. And just remember, at the very end, you can do some direct painting. I will now mask the petals and some leaf and stem shapes and allow that to dry 100% before my next pour. I think that that is the most important thing to remember with watercolor pouring is that whether you mask or you pour, each layer requires 100% dry time. 
And remember, whether it's the petals, the stems, or the leaves, each one is critical that you mask a successful silhouette shape. Here is my second layer of masking, and I will let this sit for about an hour to completely dry before starting my next pour. I've poured my purples together to save for later, and I'm now mixing up a small batch of Prussian green. Prussian green is a lovely blue mountain green that works really good with foliage and it can warm up very easily with some hands of yellow light. I'm also being mindful of the purple coloring that's already been poured, that this is gonna work like layers of glass. So you have your purple and now we're gonna be putting a layer of green on top of it, but that purple is still going to show somewhat through. So when I'm deciding on my layers of pour colors, I'm always keeping that in mind. How will this next pour get along with the colors that have already been poured? I'll also be mixing up some transparent yellow oxide, cobalt teal, and perinone orange to be able to add little color pops and splatters to enhance that Prussian green. Using the two inch hockey brush, I'll wet the paper wetting a slightly larger area than before. I still don't want to wet from corner to corner because I want to leave a lighter area in the upper right corner. I'll be using a Princeton Elite long round size 12 to add some stems and leaf work in the background. So with the hockey brush, I wet the space around the flowers. And then with this, I'm adding pathways for the paint to flow around the paper into the form of leaves, twigs, stems, grasses. This painting is titled Weeds and Innocence. So these purple flowers are called Innocence Flowers <laughs> for short. And the weeds that they were growing in were these foxtail weeds. And so I don't even really pay attention to the reference photo at this point. I'm just kind of being wild and loose and, and having fun with this cool brush, by the way. I love the Long Rounds by Princeton. Now I'll be dropping in some of that Prussian green. You may notice that I isolate this green predominantly to in and around the flowers, hoping I can get a nice dark value established. The area of highest contrast is often the focal point. So if I have a huge color contrast or value contrast, that will help draw the eye inward to where I want the focal point to be on the painting. I gently lean and rock the paper, allowing that paint to find those water pathways that I made and being careful not to have it shoot off like into the upper right hand corner, for instance, where I want there to be um, a sense of light, a lighter area there. So also doing a little finger painting to make sure I get in and around all those flowers, encouraging flow with a little bit of fine spray mist. I can um, continue to add color as long as this is wet until I get the right amount of saturation. I'll now be dropping in those additional colors of cobalt till transparent yellow oxide and one of my new favorite colors, Paranone Orange. I'm going to be working in a cascade motion from upper left hand corner to bottom right so that the color carries through the entire painting. As I rock my board to and fro, I use my fine spray mister to ensure that that upper right hand corner stays light in value. And as long as the paper is still wet, I continue to drop in color until I get the right uh, balance. And now I'm going to leave it to dry 100%. Let it be and let it dry. Here we can take a look at how the second pour dried and um, observe the dry shift and also start to plan our next layer of masking. 
An important step is to check for any areas where the paper is starting to become compromised. By compromise, I mean that areas where the paint is drying a little bit different than other areas. I noticed a couple spots and this will help me decide if the paper can take another pour. Cause you imagine each time you pour, you're just laying water on top of this paper and the paper eventually can kind of start to disintegrate. So at this point, I'm deciding to do a messy glaze instead of watercolor pour. I will be doing another masking layer first. So I'll continue to mask my stems and twigs and leaves and try and work on the foreground. So what I want to be forward, I'll mask and the things in the distance, I will leave. A few stems, twigs and leaves and cleaned up some of my shapes, always thinking about silhouettes and design. I allowed the masking fluid to dry for about an hour, gave me time to do my nails. <laughs> and um, now you can see uh, which areas I masked and we can get started with the messy glaze. I'll be using two brushes from the King Art Original Gold Series, an oval petal brush and a tri-wedge brush. For this messy glaze, I'm gonna be adding some perylene green to my Prussian green mix to get this real dark value. And I'm just gonna test that color to see if it's dark enough. This is really important because remember, it's gonna mix with the other colors on the paper, any water I add, and I really want this to be my black. Fun fact, perylene green is made with a black pigment. <laughs> so it's a great substitute for black to get that dark, dark value while still having a nature-inspired palette. I'll also be mixing up the sidekick colors. This time I'll be adding some French ultramarine, some more cobalt teal, more transparent yellow oxide and the Perignon orange, as well as some phthalo turquoise. I took a photo of my painting and then punched up the color using touch up on my phone. And I'm gonna use that as a guide to just remind myself where I want to really concentrate color. I'm also laying color on top of color in a way that it's not gonna create mud, but make beautiful blends. Remember the transparent colored glass reference I used earlier? So imagine we had a layer of purple glass, then a layer of green glass, and now we're putting these bright, bold colors on top of that. So often what I'll do is I'll just play up an area where I saw a little bit of orange, I'll put more orange. An area that's really got a pretty purple color, I'll add more purple. So really think of this messy glaze as being color pops, saturation, and value. So you'll see me being very brave and bold with color, as well as deepening those areas around the focal point, which are the flowers, to really anchor them into the painting. I'm using some of the purple from previous mixes right on this layer to mix with the other colors. I'm really looking for, remember that cascade motion. So from the upper left-hand corner to the two bottom corners, having that color flow down and around. French ultramarine is another outstanding color to use in place of black. It has a very low dry shift. So Typically, the color that I'm putting on the paper right now is going to be how bright and bold this color is. So while no, it's not a black, it is a dark value. And with watercolor pouring and messy glazes and any time that you're painting with multiple layers, you might want to wait till the very end to use black if you really need it. But sometimes you can get those value changes just with these darker valued pigments. As the paper begins to dry, you can start adding in with the perylene green some shapes of leaves and twigs. They'll blend in and out of focus depending on how dry the paper is. If you have an area that you want a little bit more out of focus, just spray it with a little bit of water. Uh, if you want an area to be 
a little bit harder of an edge and a little more pronounced, look for the drier areas of your paper. This is a really beautiful way of adding uh, lost and found foliage in the background. It also helps to anchor those darkest values and as well as keeping that objective of keeping that cascade going. So if you have color in the upper left hand corner, carrying it down and around to the bottom right hand corner. Remember, be brave, be bold. Add some pieces of grasses that are coming up out of the background. Don't worry too much um, if it's perfect or not because that wet paper is going to diffuse and soften these brush strokes. And worst case scenario, you get an area that you absolutely don't like, grab that Mr. Bottle and spray it a bit. As this dries, you'll realize how some colors have more of a shift than others. But um, one thing that I noticed is how that orange is really popping and those French ultramarine blues just really go together with the perlene green so pretty as my darks. So I let that glaze dry overnight and as you can see it's still saturated bold color so those colors really hold up to the dry shift. I'll be using a rubber cement pickup now for the big reveal <laughs> to remove the masking fluid. I've sped this part up as it does take a while, but you just gently pull your masking fluid from top to bottom with the rubber cement pickup and then rub your hand, clean hand, <laughs> gently over the surface to make sure you got all the bits. Now all the masking fluid is removed and here is our watercolor pour. Now the flowers definitely need some um, work, so I'll be doing some direct painting just to bring um, out the shapes of the flowers more, to add some definition, detail, and to balance the values with the background. I'll zoom in so you can see how I paint the petals and start to develop these flowers. My painting style stays the same, just adding in a bead of color and then deciding if I need to blend it out or not. If I decide to blend it out, I'll usually use a clean, damp brush and take it and connect it to where that bead of paint is. By doing this, it will send that paint blending out into the area that's wet. So lay an area of paint and then using a clean, damp brush, blending it, softening it, and also drop in additional colors. So you'll see me dropping in bits of pink and bits of blue, maybe even splatter a bit of color where needed. I really enjoyed the effect of dropping in the cobalt teal color into these wet petals and watching it blend. I'll continue this method up and around to each of the flowers as well as helping to define some of the background foliage as well. Laying paint, blending, splattering, splotching, dropping in <laughs> until the flowers balance with the rest of the painting. The colors that I'm using for this direct painting portion are the cobalt teal, a little bit of the purple I used in my pores, but I'm also using pure quinacridone red for my pink, the cobalt teal, and then a mixture of quinacridone red and thalo blue red shade for my purple. This portion of the painting took somewhere around 45 minutes to an hour. Um, I did do it all at once, which is important when you're doing the direct painting portion, so you keep you know, a flow, a rhythm to your painting style. And now I'm just using some of my dark greens and dark colors to just blend, soften, and enhance the background. Now 
It's good to take a close look at it to see if it's balancing. Walk away from it, come back, and make those last moment finishing touches. Those of you who follow my channel already know what that means. <laughs> yep, a little bit of stencil lifting. Now, I really want this painting to um, have a limited amount of stencil lifting. So I'm going to try and just do a bit to suggest some bokeh in the background. To stencil lift, I hold my stencil firmly on the paper and using a clean, damp toothbrush, gently scrub to lift up the, pa the paint from the paper and then I dab to reveal the pattern. I'll repeat this move in the cascade motion from the top left corner to the bottom corners and repeat this softly. <laughs> <laughs> limited amount to just have the simplest suggestion of another layer of detail, texture, and interest. I absolutely love the added bits of interest that this brings to my paintings. I'm trying to be subdued and not be gimmicky with it, so um, less is more. But I gotta warn you, as I have in my previous tutorials, it's a little addicting. <laughs> so look for spots that just need a little punch or need a little something extra. Imagine it's just a bit of seasoning on your painting. I hope you enjoyed this watercolor pour painting with messy glazing and stencil lifting. I hope that you've got something out of this video, I would love to hear in the comments section. And as always, thank you for your support, encouragement. Thanks again for watching.